So welcome everybody to this month's session of uh, Global Connections, which is a monthly series that we started at Peterson when the world was in the grip of recession. There was a lot of debate about macroeconomic challenges and a lot of concern that some of the things that policymakers had taken as uh, very important, whether international connections and open markets or the need to constrain deficits and debt or concerns about inflation, that a lot of these issues were under challenge politically, but also by uh, major economists and there was a ferment. So we wanted to bring together uh, policymakers from around the world, business leaders, academics and practitioners to debate these uh, big issues in uh, global connections. And I'm very glad to say that this week, or this month rather, we have two great speakers, one from the heart of Europe and one from the United States, but has also worked on global issues. So there's Jakob von Weizsäcker, who is the chief economist at the Ministry of Finance, and Kathy Mann, who's the outgoing chief economist at City, but was previously chief economist at the OECD in Paris. And just before we started this, we were having a heated debate about uh, share, Europe having uh, shared fiscal responsibilities, which is one of the new things that's happened uh, in Europe, very different from when I was in the White House and always debating with Germany about how to deal with the problem of Greece and so on. This uh, session today uh, is about the booming US economy and whether it will be the locomotive for global growth. Now, when we first started talking about this, it was clear that the US was recovering strongly. It was much less clear that um, Europe was going to pull quickly out of recession. And since then, uh, we've had a startling data last week that I think is feeding into market concerns today that the US economy did not add nearly as many jobs in April as people had expected, as economists had expected. So it's less than a quarter of a million rather than a million plus. And so you could say, well, maybe the premise of this discussion about the booming US economy being a locomotive uh, is somewhat undermined. I think that we still are, and the GDP data certainly showed that there was a divergence between the US and Europe in the first quarter of this year with Europe slipping back and contracting again and in, in Q1 and the US doing uh, extraordinarily well on an annualized basis, 6.4% 6, 6 growth. So I think the premise is still uh, correct, but I think it's also interesting to look, we will come back to this issue of what was happening with jobs. Was it uh, supply or it's really a raw such test uh, of people's views, whether you thought that uh, there was a lack of demand and last week's US unemployment data made the stronger case for more stimulus or whether the opposite was true and labor supply was limited, including because of the very generous temporary unemployment benefits that are part of uh, last month's 1.9 trillion uh, jobs plan, or it wasn't called it, relief plan. So I want to turn first to Jakob and ask him uh, how he sees, and I'm going to turn to Jakob and Kathy, pulling back a bit and to ask how they see this big issue about growth. And Jakob, Germany is certainly taking a very different position now from the uh, approach to fiscal policy after the global financial crisis. And governments making spending plans rather than austerity proposals. Uh, but this hasn't yet pulled up US growth. So, I mean, European growth. So again, maybe the US is gonna be the locomotive and I would love to hear your reactions to that. Karen, thank you very much um, for inviting us and inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure um, to be here. And I want to start by re-emphasizing what you hinted at, at in passing, that when this crisis started, 
it wasn't so clear from an economic perspective how important the supply shock angle of this crisis was, because clearly it's a supply shock, you know, um, shops having to shut down, factories um, with supply chain disruptions shutting down, um, a massive supply, supply shock. And then at the same time, clearly, and now we have the data, a massive demand shock, um, uh, and not least because people are scared and they start to save a lot and, and so on. And so it's both. Um, and I think it's impressive if you look at it globally and also if you look at tra transatlantically, how quickly people came to realize that the demand side of things really did warrant a massive response. Um, and that's what we got on both sides of the Atlantic, a massive uh, response. Um, and uh, uh, of course, part of um, that massive response, if you look at the US is still in Congress, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a massive response indeed. And um, uh, I think the IMF estimates it's a 16 trillion US dollar um, fiscal response uh, globally. That's very impressive. And, uh, and that's great news. Um, uh, and in, in Europe, uh, as you know, we have a slightly more uh, complicated form of organizing ourselves, which has meant that it took a little bit uh, of time uh, to translate a, 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 what I consider to be a very important initiative, this next generation EU package that um, actually did something a, more along what you have with the jobs plan in, in the pipeline, saying, well, we need to invest in digital infrastructure, we need to invest in energy transition, and we have to make certain that those countries in, in Europe and that are li a little bit more constrained fiscally nevertheless can do both at the same time they respond to the immediate need of the crisis and do these sort of longer run issues that are going to pay off in the future uh, quite a bit um, and also are going to help stabilize expectations uh, uh, immediately um, and so that for, for europe um, was, was a it was a, um, a, a enormous achievement and even though the money will only start flowing uh, um, in July um, 2021, um, the impact it has had on member states' fiscal policy um, and on expectations was such that it really did help us. And I don't think uh, it would be fair to say that if you compare notes transatlantically, that it's mainly about fiscal response. It, take the example of Germany. Of course, Germany is only part of the European economy. But if you look at 2020 and compare um, the actual GDP growth outcome, which was, was of course shrinkage, um, to um, so the, the expected trajectory before um, the crisis hit, um, and the actual outcome, we were about six percent below that, and that's comparable to the U.S. Only that, of course, the expected growth before the pandemic in the U.S. was slightly higher um, than in, in, in Germany. But, uh, but the, the difference is, is comparable. And so I wouldn't make too much. I mean, the, the political economy in different parts of the world is different. The, the needs that one has, uh, have, uh, they're slightly different. The system is different. We have more automatic stabilizers, for example. So there's some differences. I wouldn't make too much of it. Uh, and that's why I think it's useful to bring in the second element because it's a health crisis. And in a health crisis, of course, um, what matters beyond fiscal policies, some economists may not like it, but is actually help. You know, people are dying and uh, we need vaccinations and so on. And there I find in the transatlantic comparison instructive and at the same time slightly bewildering. Because if you look at, and of course there's been an election in between, but if you look at the US, um, the US did really rather well um, on the sort of ordering of vaccines and production fronts so the vaccine front. But um, if you know that vaccines are coming up, of course, in the meantime, you want to be really careful that not too many people die. Um, and so the US was rather good in making sure that on arrival, this other shore sort of um, it was, was better prepared than in Europe, but bridging the gap into the future um, wasn't done so successfully. And in Europe, to some extent, it's the inverse. We were, by and large, and um, of course, there are regional differences, 
slightly more successful in you know making sure with rather drastic and conventional measures um, that uh, um, uh, the pandemic didn't spread so much to the extent, uh, and again, there, there are regional differences that matter a lot, but, and, and that's certainly true for Germany if you look at the numbers, but we were lagging behind a bit, unfortunately, when it came to the ordering of vaccines and production and so on. Having said this, by the way, um, there's also one slight difference that may be worth mentioning. We, we actually did export some vaccines, even though we had shortages. And uh, but, but I don't want to go into the details of that. But um, uh, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to vaccination drive, there is basically one quarter difference between um, the US and Europe, um, and that's a bit of a drag, of course, uh, right now in Europe. Um, and uh, uh, fortunately, um, uh, uh, I think there were times when people thought it might not be one quarter, but two quarters. It seems that we now um, have limited uh, the damage um, on that front to one quarter. And so vaccination is proceeding very rapidly uh, throughout the EU. Um, and so once that is achieved, this drag on growth that we currently see because there's still many countries in lockdown mode, including uh, my own, um, uh, is going to go away. And, and the second half of the year um, will be, uh, um, I think we're bound to see much more dynamic uh, growth. And that leads me to my last point, uh, and don't worry, <laughs> I'll finish there. Um, I think once we've gotten the vaccination right on both sides of the Atlantic, um, it is extremely important that we do not forget um, that there's a whole world out there uh, where um, it would be unacceptable uh, for the vaccination to, you know, go on well into 2023. Um, and uh, with all the dangers, both to the world economy and to public health that come with it. Um, so uh, while, uh, while the prospects, I think, are, are reasonably good, and um, now on both sides of the Atlantic, um, this is a, a, um, a, a problem, the global health problem that still needs funding and organization and needs to be addressed urgently. And if we um, don't do that, we don't uh, live up to our humanitarian obligations. And frankly, it, it wouldn't be in our um, enlightened self-interest to, to fail on that front. So I think that's a very important part of what we need to worry about and um, in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. There was a lot there and I'm really glad that you reminded uh, us about the public health crisis. And I agree with you, there's this been this strange uh, uh, switch in, in approach. And we'll get back to that and the links between the public health and global cooperation and, uh, and the economic performance. Um, Kathy, I wanted to ask you, you've been used both at City, but obviously also at OECD at uh, taking a global view and quite frankly, watching the major economies and policymakers struggle with how to promote a strong economic system, a strong financial system. And more recently, uh, you can date it maybe from some period after the global financial crisis, European crisis, uh, countries tended to turn inward. And we've seen that obviously in the US in the previous administration with America first, but that has not completely gone away now, uh, maybe not gone away at all. So how do you see uh, this period going forward? And will we go back to the US being the consumer of last resort? Uh, does that matter? Uh, or are we going to have a more segregated and isolated patches of uh, performance in the world? So over to you, Kathy. And I should just tell all our listeners that we are going to open up for q and in, in, in a while after we've had a discussion. And when you have questions, if they occur to you as the speakers are speaking, please use the Q&A function. Don't use the chat, use the Q&A function. Thanks very much, Kathy. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Caroline, and uh, delighted to be here with uh, Jakob. Um, so let's let's step back a little bit um, and talk about the you know the ways in which uh, U.S. Um, and uh, you know the the U.S. policy is, has been different 
Uh, so I wanna make the points first about the uh, fiscal policy differences uh, and its implications for the rest of the world through the trade channel. Uh, I then want to make the point about looking at how these fiscal policy differences and monetary policy similarities between the US and Europe have implications for inflation differentials and how financial markets react, may react to that uh, with uh, not trade spillovers, but financial market spillovers. And then the third dimension is to talk about uh, the consequences for quote, quote, vaccination spillovers. In other words, uh, what are the, the third dimension of the US as a locomotive, or if you wanna call it that, uh, the third dimension being vaccination and, and uh, vaccine spillovers. So let's talk about the first one, uh, which is spillovers through the trade channel. Uh, this is the most obvious uh, place at which the differences between US fiscal policy and European fiscal policy, and, and frankly, other countries' fiscal policies really are stark. Uh, it's, it is, you know, yes, all countries uh, rose to the challenge uh, and deployed fiscal policy in the face of the pandemic. That was very important, but the US really did it more, multiples more in terms of uh, size, as also in terms of the type of instrument being used. Uh, what uh, countries differed in terms of whether they focused on automatic stabilizers, which as Jakob said, was very important in Europe, whether they focused on supporting business, which was relatively important in China, or whether the support was through the channel of putting more money into pockets, which is, was the strategy uh, that the US deployed, as well as supporting business, uh, which is also what the strategy of the US deployed. So when we think about the magnitude of the US fiscal program in the United States, and of course we still have some more being considered, the magnitude is, is orders of magnitude larger than <clears throat> in Europe and, and then in other countries. And the, the, the manner, who, like who got it, so to speak, uh, much more in terms of actual, as I say, dollars in the pocket, which then translates into consumer spending. So the way in which the US becomes a locomotive is because of the, the nature of fiscal policy, uh, more money into consumer pocketbooks, what do they spend it on? They spend it on goods because they can't spend it on services, at least in, in, the, in the lockdown. Goods are very import intensive, you know, buy them from the rest of the world. Uh, and that is the very simple way in which the US is the global locomotive for uh, 2021 and probably into 2022 as well as people's consumption continues to be robust because they did get a lot of additional money. Um, and it, it's, there's going to be a smoothing of consumption. It didn't all get spent at once. So that's the sort of, in some sense, that's a trade channel. Uh, by our calculation, it adds about 30 basis points to global growth. And the U.S. is basically the only economy, by our calculations, that in 2021 is running a, a bigger deficit. Everyone else is either running a bigger surplus or a smaller deficit. So the U.S. really is the only one that has. Uh, a contribution to global growth through the trade channel. Okay, now let's move to the second question though, or the second point, which is um, the spillovers through the financial channels. And I think this is a very important one to consider because when we do our calculations, we actually find that some of the potential for financial turbulence emanating from the United States has larger impacts on the global economy through capital flows and through interest rates than the trade benefit. So let's think about what this financial channel is and where it comes from. So of course the issue here is that um, the concerns of, uh, in financial markets as well as by, for policymakers, but mostly the concerns in financial markets, particularly in the United States, that inflation is going to rise. So uh, because of the fiscal stimulus, uh, because of, uh, and so forth. So when financial markets incorporate uh, higher inflation, nominal interest rates rise. Nominal interest rates rising have global implications uh, through um, uh, changing of asset valuations, uh, changing of the exchange value of the dollar, which has implications for emerging markets and debt exposures. And all of those financial channels are also uh, have you know, international implications 
And these are not the Federal Reserve raising the policy rate. No, it's not a policy that's making this uh, happen. It is financial markets incorporating inflation into nominal interest rates. And so when we look at that type of channel of transmission, we actually find that the potential for financial turbulence measured as say a yield curve change or VIX change, that those financial trans, uh, transmission channels are larger than the trade quote, quote, benefit of the locomotive. And we already saw the implications of this for, um, for Europe when the, when the European Central Bank uh, changed its asset purchase program in response to this tightening of financial conditions in Europe, which were, as they said, unwarranted in light of the uh, domestic situation within the Euro, within the Euro area. Now let's turn to the third uh, uh, channel, which is vaccines and vaccinations. Um, it is absolutely true, and I agree very much with Jacob, that it is critical that um, we get a, uh, a global uh, uh, sort of uh, improvement in our vaccination uh, availability. Uh, so it's not just uh, you know, the, the, the rich countries that are able to get their populations vaccinated. Um, but I, uh, and, and the reason why, number really not just obviously the health reason is the main reason why we want to have that, um, everybody getting on board with vaccines and vaccinations. But of course, economically, the role of tourism, very important for a lot of economies. And until there is a clearer improvement in vaccinations and, um, and, and immunity, we will not have a return to growth uh, in tourism, international tourism, and all of the benefits that, is ne that, that accrue to economies that are very dependent on tourism. But I caution, I caution that we focus, uh, that we have to focus not just on vaccine availability, critical that you have it, but it's very clear in countries, not in, it's clear already in the advanced economies where vaccines are available and people are choosing not to have them, not to take them. And this is a concern in emerging markets as well, that it's not just availability, but it's also deployment and acceptance. Two channels, you know, three channels, you have to get it, you have to deploy it, which is not so simple. And number three, you have to have people accept it and to take it. And so this third channel of, uh, of global, sort of global engagement uh, of the vaccinations and uh, spillovers of vaccine availability is perhaps um, one of the most challenging. Uh, so the global, conclude, US has global mo a locomotive through the trade channel, Yep, that's a consequence of the fiscal policy choices and the magnitude in the United States. It's clear, it's happening. Uh, caution on um, the US uh, uh, spillovers of financial turbulence through uh, you know, incorporating inflation into financial market metrics. That's a real uh, issue. We've already seen the consequences of that. And number three, spillovers of vaccinations. Uh, it's going to be harder to get to the goal line here than I think just the focus on availability alone. Thanks very much, uh, Kathy. And I want to, we'll get to the issue, obviously, the big issues of um, the locomotive and how this will play out, including with, uh, with China and globally. And it's very interesting, this distinction between the trade channel and the financial channel and how we interpret uh, what's happening in financial markets. I want to go uh, immediately next to, um, however, to back, or back to the public health question that you and Jakob both brought up and, and uh, at the end of your remarks, because of course, A, as Jakob says, this is a public health crisis and you don't want people to be dying. And, um, and then there is the economic impact from that. One of the things that I found a bit puzzling is that the US economy, which, uh, well, in the United States, obviously the, the hospitalizations and deaths were very bad. Um, and we really performed poorly compared to most of the rest of the world. 
but that didn't have an economic, such an economic impact in part because there were not the lockdowns. Um, and, uh, and in a way it's, it's, uh, it's very concerning if you think that, well, people just get used to the idea that there will be a lot of hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, but there, you raised the point about tourism and I would think business travel also. There are important areas that won't come back if the rest of the world is, or if there is not, um, maybe not herd immunity, but a general acceptance that this thing has been controlled. Uh, and so I wanted to go to, to Jakob first about the, the pandemic and are we... Um, May, you talked a little bit about how in Europe maybe it's just a one quarter delay. I think that's really good news. Maybe you could just <clears throat> say a little bit more about why there was a delay and why you think that's gone. And, uh, you know, it's easy from Washington to think, oh, well, typical in Europe, they take a long time to decide on things and then they don't do enough and so on. I'm going to come back to the Europe, to the American criticism in a while, but how do you see that? Do you, do you think Europe is now uh, united and able to get out the vaccines locally and going to be able to look to helping others? As you said, you have been uh, exporting also. It's a problem in the US. So over to you, Jakob. Well, obviously, um, the vaccination itself um, is, is, is a logistical challenge and, and there's some minor differences among member states in, um, uh, but, um, and uh, regions, for example, in Germany. But, but frankly, in the greater scheme of things, once the vaccines are there, there if you have uh, a functioning public health service, if you have um, uh, a, you know, <laughs> basically a functioning government, um, in the end, you'll get them out there. And some will be a little bit faster, some will be a little bit slower, but if the vaccine is there, they're going to be delivered. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm optimistic uh, that in Europe, as I said, unfortunately, this one quarter was lost. And it's an interesting question. Well, why was it? Uh, not least because um, some of the more successful vaccines, they were even, you know, they were developed in Europe. Um, why was it uh, that then um, uh, Europe was slow to, um, <laughs> you know, uh, to build up a water pipeline and, and, and be among the first to, to actually get the produced vaccines out there? And you're right, there were some, if you will, transaction costs at the European level. Um, and I think to some extent there was also a curious disconnect between the economic community and the health community. Because in a time when we were busy discussing in the economic community, if you will, you know, ministers of finance and so on, a 750 billion next generation EU package um, in, in sort of the health track in Europe, they were haggling about a, a, a couple of billion um, on, you know, can, can we afford it? <laughs> and, and so that, um, I think there's a lesson to be learned here uh, that it's important uh, that um, economists talk to health people <laughs> and the other way around. And I think when we do that, and I think that's more broadly a lesson um, that, uh, that it can be applied to many countries in many situations, including this global challenge now, um, I think by and large, the outcomes will be better. And I'm not saying <laughs> it's the economists always enlightening the health people. <laughs> I think it may in some instances very much also be the other way around. So, so I think that's, that's definitely a takeaway from what we can learn from the crisis. Fortunately, uh, now um, the, these difficulties, they've been sorted out. Um, and I think some of the institutional lessons to be drawn, um, including sort of on the pa pandemic preparedness front, are being drawn um, on the economic front. I think with next generation EU, if this works well, and, and uh, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, we, we have to actually have to um, then deliver it well. But if it works well, the outcome is good. This will, I think, also be a very useful blueprint um, uh, for future crises and even a blueprint for certain institutional developments in, in, in the European uh, Union. Uh, one of the reasons why my minister um, some time ago said, well, this could be, with hindsight, a Hamiltonian moment even. Uh, for, 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 for the EU. So, so um, an interesting 
and, and situation in, in, in Europe um, on that front. But I think uh, after initial serious difficulties, uh, a relatively bright outlook. And I just want to add one uh, um, a macro um, a thought uh, to what Catherine was saying. Um, you're quite right. The US is, um, is if, you, if you do the numbers, um, if you do the volumes, um, th th there's a lot of fiscal impulse in 2021. But just to, um, I don't have the numbers here on, on, uh, on the EU overall, but I have the numbers for Germany. Uh, we had a, um, a fiscal deficit um, of a shy of four and a half percent de facto. And I mean, we had planned for more, but de facto it was, uh, it was uh, to, to the tune of that. Um, and in 2021, we have planned for in our budgetary plans the double, uh, you know, a nine percent deficit. But of course, um, whether all of this money will be called upon, and even for those areas you wouldn't traditionally call automatic stabilizers, there is an element of automatic stabilization. Take our company support scheme. Um, we have to the tune of 2% of GDP allocated to it. Now, if the third and the fourth quarter um, turn out to be rather good, then of course uh, that money won't be used because it's, it's sort of, it's automatic. Um, if uh, countries have a certain drop in, uh, in revenues and so on, they'll get the support. If they don't, they won't. Um, the same is true for short-time work. Uh, if there are lots of short-time workers out there, uh, we'll prop it up. It's in the budget. If it, uh, so, so I think um, in, in a way, um, uh, when it now comes to a stage of the crisis where we have to make absolutely certain that we do not tighten prematurely, uh, and Europe, and I think that's one of the lessons we learned 10 years ago, we all set on avoiding that pitfall. At the same time, we don't know because uh, the crisis is moving so fast. We don't know exactly what the right amount will be. And the way we're solving it is by saying, well, we, we put it in the budget, we have our systems in place now, it took a while to set them up. And if they're being needed, that's wonderful. The money goes out. And if they're not needed, frankly, why spend the money on crisis when we can spend it on other things like I don't know, infrastructure? And, and so, um, in a sense, um, I want to nuance a little bit this idea that uh, we've started to contract in 2021. That's not what we're doing. Um, but uh, I think to some extent, the delivery of the fiscal stimulus is somewhat more conditioned in Europe in the spirit, say, of automatic stabilizers, even when that's not strictly the right description of what's going on, on the actual outcomes quarter by quarter. And that in itself, I don't think necessarily is a bad thing. Thanks, that's very interesting. And maybe Kathy, I can ask you to pick up on that. Um, in the context of, uh, of course, from Europe, people look at the US and think uh, the governance here is pretty challenged. Uh, with the uh, very sharp political divides. And um, that has also led to kind of complications about how fiscal stimulus is administered. We know clearly that there is a lot coming already from December from, and then from March. There are, of course, um, people, including at Peterson, who worry that it's too much because as Jacob said, it's not conditioned on the whole uh, on uh, economic, what's happening to the economy. Uh, and so I, I wonder if you think that the enormous fiscal plans that even some uh, liberals in Europe might think uh, evidence that the US has lost its mind because they're so big, um, are these such that uh, you fear the they will tip into too much inflation or will not be the right ways to, uh, to, to manage the economy going forward. And to Jakob's last point, how does this implicate uh, the plans for infrastructure and, and so on? Uh, so you've, you've uh, sort of uh, encapsulated a number of different issues there. Let me start by um, noting, you know, we do have very different institutional structures between uh, Europe and um, the use of guarantees, a much more uh, robust social safety net. Um, and so I, I appreciate uh, what Jakob was saying about we've got the structures in place, 
so that if we need to be supporting through furloughs or, or short time work or uh, business that, that we've got the budget uh, to put aside for that. Um, that sort of means that you're ready to go in, in the case of, of uh, if things turn out to be a little bit weaker than originally uh, thought. The US, I, I think we have to, I think one of the uh, important points about the magnitude of the last program in particular, and, and even to some extent, the earlier programs. Let's think about what does it mean when you add an additional $600 to an unemployment check last year, or a $300 to the unemployment check this year. One of the, one of the sort of objectives of that, uh, and of course the implications, is that people who were at the lowest income levels prior to COVID actually are getting more in terms of their uh, paycheck uh, now than they actually got in their paycheck pre-COVID. So there was an, I think we have to recognize that there's an element in these, in these I call them life preserver programs because they're not really stimulus, they're life preservers. They are replacement and augmentation of people's uh, uh, wages, uh, and, and of course some business aspects of it as well through the PPP program. But it is, it was, uh, I don't think we ever really said it, but let's say that this is um, partly to try to ameliorate a very deep inequality in uh, income in the United States. And uh, it's maybe by stealth, uh, and maybe isn't going to work because these, these programs are going to run out. And then we are faced with the same sort of problem set of jobs at the bottom of the income ladder. <clears throat> they were not good pre-COVID, <clears throat> excuse me. They're not gonna be good post-COVID either. Um, and so the experiment that we are currently involved in in the United States with some states eliminating these unemployment top-ups to try to get people back to work I think it's going to be an interest, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a I, I, as an economist, I can say it's an interesting experiment, but of course, for those people for whom this really was the difference between being above and below the poverty line, uh, you know, that's not an interesting experiment to them. It's, 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 a, it's a very major concern. One um, sort of analog, which I think is useful to consider is, um, <clears throat> When we think about support for businesses, which is very prevalent in Europe and a little bit less so in the United States, but there's some, there's some there, is we talk about zombie companies being kept alive through some of these programs. Uh, very important question in Europe. In the US, what I think we're, we would like to do is how do we improve the bottom of the income distribution uh, so that post COVID, we have a better income distribution. What can we do in the course of this crisis and this very major approach to fiscal policy to actually come out of the crisis with a better uh, income distribution? And of course, the original objective of putting in a $15 minimum wage uh, as part of uh, the January uh, program, which of course didn't happen, that was, that was one way to try to lift up the bottom. Now I have to comment, of course, that many states do have higher minimum wages. It's not the 725, which is the federal. Many states have already passed that. It was passed by ballot initiative at the local level in many states. So, you know, the fact that it couldn't be done at the federal level is an, is an interesting comment. But as I say, um, I think we have to recognize that some of the aspects of these programs that were put into place was to try to cement an improvement at the low end of the distribution. And of course, if we think again about the families plan, which is, which is, you know, there's the jobs plan, which is kind of the infrastructure plan. And then there's the families plan, which is kind of like the social infrastructure plan. Um, again, this is directed towards trying to improve the social safety net in the United States so that post COVID, we will have a social safety net and a low end of the income distribution that are going to come out better. So that I think we, we have to kind of acknowledge that and, and, and put it forward that, you know, we don't want the jobs at the low end of the distribution post COVID because they weren't very good pre COVID. So we got to do better. Um, now, the concern that you have, that you brought out up about, um, you know, the inflation, uh, or are we going to get too much inflation out of this set of plans? 
uh, I think it's important to look at the inflation process, inflation expectations, commodity prices, tightness in the labor markets and wages. And then of course, the, you know, the most important thing is, can firms raise prices? Do they have pricing power? Each one of those elements needs to be evaluated. And so far we do, we, you know, inflation expectations, not a problem. Commodity prices, yeah, we've got an enormous issue going on with commodity prices, particularly with regard, uh, in comparison to last year. Tightness in, in labor markets, well, we're, we're, we got a definitely discussion about that, uh, but we don't really see a whole lot of wage increases that are sustained. Um, and then this firm pricing power, we start to see uh, firms saying, yes, I'm gonna raise my prices this year. I couldn't raise them last year, I'm gonna raise them this year. But does that turn into a spiral? Does that turn into a spiral? We don't think so, but it's very clear that this is the question that is of greatest concern right now. Um, the last point that, that you asked about um, is you know, it's a, sort of the uh, trade-offs, potential trade-offs between the various fiscal programs that are uh, in place and then are contemplated. Uh, I think in a very important question is how many times can you go back to the well? And uh, you know, there was a fairly big dipper pulled out in January uh, out of the well. And I think that does make it more challenging to go back to the well two more times for the types of improvements that are structurally important for the global, for the US economy, but also for the global economy, infrastructure and uh, traditional infrastructure and social infrastructure, critically important structural aspects to improve potential output in the United States. And I'm worried that we're not gonna be able to go back to the well to get those done. Yes, and I, I, I like your pointing to the uh, temporary unemployment benefit as a, as a way to lift uh, very low incomes. And I think that is a problem in, in the United States that is not, and obviously the lack of a social safety net that is different um, from the situation in, in Europe. But I, I would like to ask Jakob how you see, if you see implications for Europe of this massive fiscal experiment in the US. Obviously there are implications for Europe, as you mentioned about the next gen fund, does that work? Is it, importantly, is it seen to work? Um, because just one note of caution, I remember well, and, and you all re will remember that, uh, whereas there's an agreement now, I think in the US and amongst economists that the stimulus of, uh, in the first year of the Obama administration, that stimulus um, was too small. But since it failed to uh, combat rising unemployment and get the economy going again, it became the package itself and stimulus itself was blamed for many things like uh, continued high unemployment. So a, a failure to get strong growth can be blamed on the very thing that, uh, that has stopped it from being even, uh, even worse. And I, so I'd be interested in, in your reactions on that, Jakob. But also, if you look at the US from Europe, uh, is there sort of interest, is this an interesting experiment in various ways, or are there concerns that um, the, the debate that is pretty um, intense here about whether there's too much fiscal or not enough, how do you see that? And, and just to remind people, uh, we've got some Q's and A's, I'm wrapping them into my questions as well, but do use the Q&A function if you'd like. So Jakob. I very much agree with Kathleen on the description of the various channels for uh, spillovers. But I, of course, your question was much more geared, uh, um, if I understood correctly, towards the question, well, what, what, what does one make of it on the other side of the Atlantic? And there, I, I would say, um, we've discussed a little bit some institutional differences and the important one and also distributional differences um, between uh, uh, both sides of the Atlantic. And I think it's important to realize uh, that um, the needs in the US are different. Uh, the political economy is different, including the political economy of Congress. Um, uh, um, and uh, so the situation is simply different. Um, and I think that's very much recognized in, in Europe. Um, and um, uh, uh, we, 
we are, we are of course absolutely delighted uh, that many of the challenges uh, that need addressing are now being addressed um, and we try to do our best I mean, it's not as if we don't have our own problems with the, you know reducing our co2 emissions for example our own social problems even though they they may be of slightly different nature um, but uh, so I, I don't think the mode, the mood in Europe is to say, well, um, we are too worried about, is it a little bit too small? Is it a bit, little bit too big? Um, I think it's more sort of broadly speaking, we seem to have managed to stabilize incomes. Um, if you look at, um, I, and I think that's useful, um, a little bit below the sort of pure macro numbers, look at bankruptcies um, in, 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 throughout Europe, um, it's under control. There may be a little bit of a backlog, but probably in most parts of Europe, it's not this huge uh, thing that is going to fly in our face, um, uh, uh, which leads me to um, your second question, um, uh, where you make the interesting distinction between correlation and causality, uh, where, of course, if things turn out badly in Europe, um, then maybe next generation EU will get a bad name, even though they, things would have been much worse. Uh, if it hadn't been for next generation EU, <laughs> I would be inclined to think that. Uh, but um, but I think the point is, um, it, since uh, um, we're much focused, and, and I think that's uh, probably a transatlantic difference, we're not so much focused on, you know, maximizing the size of the stimulus now. I think we are very much focused in, in terms of also political economy in making sure we don't withdraw support too early don't withdraw support prematurely. Um, and I think that's very important. That's, that's very important in, in, in macro terms, but that's also very important for the cohesion of, of the union. Um, and I think to the extent uh, that it does have an impact, it will certainly help to prevent uh, a, 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 a situation where um, next generation EU gets a bad name just because the situation looks terrible. I think the outlook is reasonably good. Um, for now, the spillovers, by the way, of course, from the US, they're positive. Um, uh, if, if, if it came to some of the financial um, uh, spillovers, interest rate uh, uh, questions and so on, uh, the, the sign might reverse. But I think in the greater scheme of things, um, uh, uh, we're, we're delighted. Um, if you look at the G7, it, it's working well. Um, uh, um, we have the fiscal support, I think, globally that we require. Um, uh, uh, there, there, there are certain challenges on, on the health front that I think need to be taken very seriously, but uh, it's not as if, um, uh, um, unless, of course, you know, either inflation or interest rates or both, uh, um, uh, all of a sudden off, have big surprises for us in store, um, we, we, we don't have this, uh, this worry that there'll be a, a, a big, big macro problem uh, uh, luring at the end of it. Provided, of course, Thanks. that's really interesting. Yeah, Go that, that we, you know, that we don't become unreasonable, unreasonable in the sense that, you know, imagine in, in the euro area, if you have fiscal trajectories that are simply, you know, completely beyond what anybody uh, um, uh, would find sustainable, that would be a massive problem. But, uh, um, but, but so, so I, I think, I think we're cautiously optimistic that things will work out. Um, provided uh, that, uh, um, and we don't have any reason to doubt that, that everybody will, will, will stay reasonable. Thanks very much. And it's very interesting the way that I think in the US, the lesson as it's been described uh, about the response to the, to the global financial crisis is that we went too small. Uh, and you're describing the lesson in Europe as being... Um, we withdrew support too soon. So it's, it's a nuanced difference, but I think it is an important one in a way. It, it leads to the same outcome, which is don't um, step on the brakes uh, too much. In the US, it's maybe also incorporates, put your foot right down on the accelerator, but uh, at least not putting your foot on the brakes is probably a smart idea. And I, I wanted to continue uh, to you, Jacob, and in the last uh, 10 minutes that we have, maybe bring in, uh, I don't want to say the elephant in the room, but the other big issue uh, 
about global cooperation, whether it's on climate, whether it's on global health, and whether it's on macro. And that is the relations that we see with uh, China. And we had a question early on uh, from one of the audience about does strategic competition between the US and China impact uh, the transatlantic recovery or transatlantic relations. And I think there's, uh, you know, we know that after the global financial crisis, for example, China was an important uh, locomotive for the global economy and an important partner in stabilizing the uh, financial system. That uh, if it's happening, it's ha gonna happen more behind the scenes now than frontally, except possibly on, uh, on climate issues. And I would love to hear the view from Europe because I think um, previously there's been a bit of a view from the US that Europe is going to regards China in more of a economic or mercantilist or trade sense. You know, they're a big important partner and less in the geostrategic, we need to watch out uh, sense. Um, but I'd be curious to see and I guess it feeds, you mentioned the G7, then it feeds into the question of the G20, which will be taking place in Italy uh, later this year. Is that a place where there can be cooperation uh, in, a, in a broader group of countries? So how do you see, uh, Jacob, the, um, the impact of uh, China's actions and perhaps the US uh, you know, concerns about China on the global economy and on Europe. Yes, <laughs> very good, and, and of course, very important and and and, and difficult questions uh, that you uh, you voice here. I, I think the first thing is, um, um, in, in in a very good way, in recent months, uh, the Atlantic has gotten a lot smaller, um, and um, and I think that's 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 really very helpful. To address some of these challenges, and, and so I think that's that's good news. Uh, secondly, um, uh, beyond uh, the pandemic, uh, um, there's of course a new, very fashionable word. It's called resilience, um, and it encapsulates not only some of the experiences that we've had in the pandemic, but also encapsulates some of the concerns one might have um, in situations where it's not entirely clear. Whether whether everybody uh, around the table will play things by the by by by, by, by the rules, and um, uh, um, uh, I think in Europe we're quite mindful of some of the the, the dangers uh, um, that uh, um, uh, come about when people don't play things by the rules. At the same time, uh, of course, we would be somewhat wary if the um, uh, in itself beautiful word resilience where come to be understood just as another word for protectionism. And, uh, and, and, and that's something uh, I think we would worry uh, 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 quite a bit about. Um, but uh, um, uh, um, I think chances are, and if you look at uh, China, of course, uh, the, um, some of the political difficulties, they, they remain quite acute. Um, at the same time, in terms of locomotive uh, um, for the global economy, China is, is having pretty good growth rates as well, just as the US growth prospects um, are good. So um, I think it will, um, it will be a matter of precision. We need to be very precise, including um, in the G7, including transatlantically, when the problems are real, they need to be addressed for real, if you will. Um, and uh, um, at the same time, um, it, it, we live in a world uh, where without a very decent label, a level of G20 cooperation, um, uh, um, many of the problems that we need to solve, many of the pr much of the progress that we, we will need to make uh, it will not be possible. Um, and uh, um, I think that's the way we would look at it um, in, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, again, um, <laughs> I hope I'm not sounding too Panglossian here, but I think uh, the situation has become a lot easier in that respect in, in, in recent months. Thanks very much. And I like a couple of phrases there that you uh, mentioned. One, the Atlantic has become smaller. Uh, that's very nice. 
conceivably the, the, the channel between the UK and Europe has become a little wider, but uh, we may have a mention of that. But, and then your other point that resilience is a, is a great word, but uh, it should not be used to, uh, to just to put a nice cover over protectionism. And perhaps I can turn to you, Kathy, and see how you see the impact on the global economy, but also on the challenges, the macroeconomic challenges and the policy challenges uh, that we all face together from uh, what is from relations between the United States and China. Uh, so um, picking up on what Jakob was saying about uh, Brazilian shouldn't be uh, the new euphemism for protectionism. You know, the US and China are both very large closed economies. I mean, uh, the US is, is essentially a closed economy. We've always talked about it that way. It's not, but uh, China has increasingly moved in the direction of, of, you know, a closed economy in the economic sense of producing a higher share of its uh, consumer goods and investment goods internal to the country. So, so you know, there is a, there's a seduction in thinking that, if, that it's safer to produce things at home, that that's where the resilience comes in. It's safer to have, you know, the pharmaceuticals at home the manufacturing at home, the let's, you know, all sorts of things, producing it at home, food security, national security, manufacturing security, innovation security, technical security, everything, it should be done at home. And that that is, is very seductive. Now, it's interesting, Europe, if you think about it as a as an economic unit, it is as large as the US and China, you know, population, grow, uh, you know, GDP, et cetera, pretty much in the same neighborhood of the size. And yet, because it's a collection of small open economies, it's still collectively, it's as big, but it doesn't act that way because it says, you know, I know as a small open economy, how important global interactions are for, uh, for food security, for national security, for technology innovation, so that the interrelationships are more important uh, and I think it's recognized within within Europe because again it comes it comes at its bigness as a place of population and GDP it comes at that as a set of small open economies who who remember the the importance of the of global interactions. So I think what what I I worry about is as I say this there's this seduction in the big countries that are, are big countries and have always been big countries that uh, we don't need the rest of the world we don't need that. Um, so you, you brought up the G20, um, and that is a, um, a place where uh, countries of different sizes, uh, collectively a very uh, large share of the global economy get to uh, come together and have discussions. It's a very productive group. I know some people think of these groups as not being all that useful, but it, it has a very productive role in, its, in the frequency of meetings. It's an opportunity to be exchange the views and to kind of um, you know, cool down from some of the political and other rhetoric that can, can be the, you know, the, the major thing that we read about in the newspapers and so forth to achieve some improve, you know, to really achieve some uh, benefits that are uh, the hallmark of global cooperation. And, you know, Financial Stability Board in the time, the discussions about these uh, fiscal programs, monetary policy cooperation, um, the other big items on the plate, of course, are uh, related to uh, international taxation, where change in view on the U.S. side is, has really uh, potentially created a more momentum for global minimum tax for multinationals. Uh, there's some issues uh, about that, of course, that need to be addressed. It's not a clear sailing down to the outcome there. Um, and then, of course, the, the critical longer term issue of climate. Um, and the G20 has, has been an, a, a, a convening body to address climate issues. And when you think about who's in there, there are, you know, there, there are both the uh, emitters, uh, there are the ones who have, uh, shall we say, a lot of stranded assets, should uh, a carbon price be implemented um, at a global level through one channel or another. Uh, so, you know, there, this is a place where, where uh, some, some clear uh, benefits to the global economy cooperation, 
uh, between countries that in other spheres uh, continue to have uh, rising challenges. So I, I do look to the G20 as a place where we can get uh, traction on some of these very important global issues. Great, thanks. And I'm gonna give the last word to Jakob. Uh, I certainly remember uh, in the G20, although it's an economic body, it was possible to have uh, negotiations about climate, about trade, and about the Ebola response. And uh, so I see that as potentially a very uh, fruitful ch channel, but um, it also, you know, it requires work and, and support from, from there. And maybe it doesn't seem such an important channel uh, from Europe. Um, and obviously the US is trying out different groups of, uh, of uh, particular countries that uh, to consult with, but Tony Blinken, the new Secretary of State has emphasized the important links with Europe and, and the United States, as well as the UK and the United States. I'd love to hear how you see the best channel for, from Europe's point of view for collaboration and cooperation on these big issues, Jakob? Well, I think there are two questions really. The first question is when you have a problem at hand, um, of course, um, politicians have to make up their mind what is the best way to try and address them. Um, and um, often that will be um, those four, uh, sort of, for example, G20 or, or G7, but there may be instances where, where other channels uh, work even better. Um, so I, th I think that's something where, where really um, a form follows function. It depends really on what you need to do. But what I uh, would agree with entirely um, uh, uh, with Catherine is, is, is the observation um, that um, uh, the G7 and the G20 are extremely useful for us. And I think one of the reasons why they're so useful is because not only if you are in China or the US, that's also true for many European leaders and, and, and other countries, um, most of your time you deal with domestic issues and being forced on a very regular basis to broaden your horizon, to really try and look at the global issues and the multilateral issues that are at stake. I think is very important for one's mindset. Um, and uh, um, uh, also uh, it gives you a, a, a kind of esprit de corps that when there's a real crisis becomes much easier to interact because you know each other um, because you've uh, solved some perhaps not, not such big problems, but smaller problems, you know, <laughs> to some extent at least you can Well, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, I think, yeah. You can always Go on, Jakob. Yes, well, look, thank you very much to both Kathy and Jakob. I really appreciate great discussion, very um, broad ranging and nice to end on that note where, uh, you know, we can push leaders to look outward and see the rest of the world by bringing them together. And maybe we'll have another session on that issue uh, later on. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks to the audience and especially to you two for the speakers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.